everyone. It's Catherine. We're just getting Dr. Smith on. We spent the morning um, running through and doing troubleshooting. Oh, great. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the other computer. And hopefully this will work. Hi everyone, um, I'm Catherine Sayo and welcome to the webinar. It's been a t bit of a time in coming and we're really happy to be here. Um, we have been troubleshooting this morning. One of the reasons that um, we upgraded the software because we had so many people who wanted to attend the webinar. So we had to upgrade everything. So we've been ironing out some snafus. And I want to say ahead of time that we do have the um, preview of the documentary. And because we have um, over 400 people from all around the world, um, there's a little bit of a delay. So you'll hear the audio and you'll see the video but it can be a little splotchy. So I just want to let everyone know that up front. So I am going to um, start and welcome you to the lipedema project, um, the disease they call fat. And since we have so many of you from so many different places, I want to ask if you would be so kind. If when you see lipedema, if you could just add an O and see lipoedema. To be honest with you, that's the way I spell lipedema simplified, but in the U.S. it's all done without the O, so it became very complicated as we got into the legalities of setting everything up. So you will please make that leap with us. So who's on the webinar? Well, it's our lipedema community. We have over 425 people registered all around the world. You're from the US, from the UK, from Germany, the Netherlands, Australia, South Africa, Scotland, New Zealand, Finland, Ireland, Puerto Rico, Sweden, Egypt, Cyprus, Poland, Lebanon, Switzerland, and maybe a few more. And there are a few I couldn't read because my control panel is over. But you know who you are, and you're all part of a very thriving community. And let me start by saying, um, when Dr. Smith and I were preparing for this, and, I, and we were looking at what are we doing and why are we doing this, this, was, this is what came out of the conversation. And it really came from Dr. Smith is that where we are in the process with lipedema is that lipedema needs a cure. And that the fact that there's a lack of awareness is also part of a condition that we can put under the umbrella of lipedema. And that condition also needs a cure. Simply stated, we need to look at what's going on, why do we have lipedema, and how are we going to increase awareness for women who don't know that they have it, but also in the whole medical arena. And so that's why we're here today and what we're here hopefully to move forward. So our agenda for today. Well, first I want to say welcome and thank you, because if it wasn't for this community, we would not be here. We're a community of strong, brave, outrageously incredible women. And together, we've really been able to move things in unbelievable ways. So I want to thank you. And, um, and then I want to turn it over to Dr. Smith. He's going to talk a little bit about the Lipedema Project and the Friedman Center and the relationship between them. And then I would like to give you a little background on how the documentary got made, which is this moving in and of itself. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, but that's another movie. <laughs> but I will give you a little bit of the background, and then we'll have a short preview. The preview is about 10 minutes. And then I'm 
the majority of our time will be Dr. Smith. He's going to be answering. We received a lot of questions. We grouped them into distinct areas, um, many repeats, and so he'll be spending a good 45 minutes answering your questions. If you see on your panel, there's a place to put questions. We won't be able to answer questions live, which is why we ask for them ahead of time. But if you have a comment or something to say, I will be monitoring it while Dr. Smith is in the um, Q&A period. And if there's anything that I can do, um, I can um, you know, get a message to Dr. Smith. So then we're going to talk about really cure. What is it going to take for us to have a cure for lipedema? And Dr. Smith has some very definitive ideas about where we're headed. And I'd like to share with you about the awareness campaign. We've been very active putting together a social media campaign and, and a number of other things that we'll share with you. And then we just want to end up very briefly and let you know about our plans for funding for research and tell you a little bit about next steps. So I will turn this over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Catherine, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it's really amazing when I look at the map of where everyone's from. It, it's, it's pretty amazing that we can all meet like this. Uh, what is a Sunday afternoon in New York and, um, and share a little bit of time together and, and some information. So um, and I think at the end of the year here, we're, we're sort of at a point where we're looking back on what we've done and looking ahead to what, what it's possible in, in the year ahead. And so thinking about all of that, um, I, I really want to reflect a little bit on how we got here with the Friedman Center and the Lipedema Project. The Lipedema Project really came out of our work in the Friedman Center for Lipedema Research and Treatment. Um, and that came out of our work in cancer. I take care of a lot of cancer patients, and um, with that, we saw a lot of patients with lymphedema. And as we started treating many of these patients with lymphedema, we were also referred patients with lipedema, some incorrectly diagnosed, some correctly diagnosed. Um, but it soon became evident that there was a lack of awareness about this condition, um, and there was a lack of really information about it in the community. Uh, if you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the analogy of the, the, the five blind men looking at an elephant and trying to figure out, you know, trying to describe what it is. Well, what happens in medicine is we're often very siloed in our specialties and we see things through a very narrow point of view. And so we don't really see the whole patient and the whole picture. And so I would say that at this point, one of our big hurdles is the lack of awareness. And fortunately, through the Friedman Center and the uh, Friedman Foundation for Medical Research, who funds us, uh, as well as Mount Sinai Medical Center, which we are now a part of, which is the largest uh, educational uh, medical program in, in the United States, we have tremendous resources available to try and overcome some of these hurdles. And so really, um, at this point, our agenda is, is to try and see if this year we can make a big difference and, and become a catalyst for change and, and break down the inertia that's kept us from going from where we were 75 years ago when this condition was first uh, described to where we are now, which is not that much further along, to where are we going to be in the next five, ten years? Can we make, can we really start to accelerate the process? So um, today we're going to talk about a few of these things, what we're doing, where we're going, and answer some questions, and um, also let you know what you can do. I think it's important that you become active participants in this because we really need everyone contributing if we're going to make this happen. So um, I think with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it back to Catherine so she can talk a little bit about the documentary because I think we're going to start off with that and then we'll, we'll get to some questions. So um, the documentary itself is really produced at this point under the umbrella of the Lipedema Project, which the way we're looking at it is that the Lipedema Project is a transmedia awareness program about educating all about all aspects of lipedema in many different channels, many different ways, the documentary only being one part of it. So really briefly, how did we get here? Or how did I get here is sometimes how I think. And so I just want to share just a little bit about the story. 
So for me, I struggled with weight as far as I can remember. The, as I look back, puberty was a very difficult time, and I had many befores and afters. I was over 300 pounds at my heaviest, and in, my, in the mid-80s, I found a self-help group, and I weighed and measured my food and have done that for most of 27, 28 years, and I was able to maintain a moderate weight loss. Well, I lost 140 pounds, and I kept it off for most of that time. And then when I hit perimenopause, it started to regain, and regaining was a really difficult journey for me because I was doing all the right things and I was regaining the weight. I also had some complications which I now know were probably some very um, um, cysts that had become infected and I had surgery. I had many surgeries. I had five surgeries and um, in two, starting in 2009 and ending in 2011. The thing was, it was one of the best hospitals. I live in Boston. It was one of the best hospitals in Boston. And what I learned, uh, a lot of what I learned about myself during this whole process is the fear that I had talking in, in the medical profession. There were things that I asked my surgeon that were not followed through. Um, when it became evident that there were pretty intense complications, um, at one point, I was sent to the ER. They thought I had a blood clot. It turned out to be that everything had blown up from what I now know was from fat a compromise. I was misdiagnosed. It was a really difficult journey. And what ended up happening for me is I reached a turning point. And the turning point for me was when I decided that if I allowed myself, I could be really angry and become very victimized by a system that wouldn't listen to me, that wouldn't help me and um, I mean we all know we've had situations like that or I could do something about it and I'm not quite sure why or how but I decided to do the thing that I know the best which is research I started to go online and I started to research and it led to um, um, finding out about lymphedema which led for me to get diagnosed I was misdiagnosed with the lymphedema my MLD therapist handed me Dr. Foley's textbook, which I read. The way I'm a professor, so the way that you read this is not word for word, but I did go through it until I found the chapter on lipedema. When I found the chapter on lipedema, it was like reading, you know, those days when you read your astrology in the newspaper and you go, oh my God, that is so perfect. Well, that's what I felt about the description of lipedema. Additionally, what I found out is in one of her chapters, she talks about the surgical removal of adipose tissue. Well, the surgeries I had included some removal of redundant skin because I had lost so much weight and I was a massive weight loss patient. And what I didn't know at the time is the misdiagnosis of the lipedema along with the surgery induced lymphedema so I had lipo lymphedema and I was headed towards a wheelchair that was totally unacceptable for me as a solution especially I mean the one thing I am is stubborn <laughs> anyway so Dr. Foldy's book led me on a journey and part of that journey was that I was not willing to have a misdiagnosis and I, I say with such appreciation. This is from the first AGM that I attended in Birmingham of the Lipedema ladies. I want you to look. I have such love for every one of these women. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, where I was headed. I showed up in Birmingham. I said to myself, how can I go to England for a few days? I went to England for a few days. I drove on the other side of the street. There was one point where I said, okay, this is it. This is where I die. <laughs> but somehow it all worked out. And I, and I mean, as silly as it seems to me now, I said, well, I can't go to England for three or four days without coming back at something. So I'm a researcher. I said, I'll interview everybody. So I brought my little handy cam, which I had taken a course in, in, in production. I said, I'll take my handy cam. So I took my handy cam. I started to interview everyone. And not only did it move us towards this documentary, it was about hearing each other's stories in a, 
incredibly listening way. It was like we listened to each other. And out of that listening, so many things became apparent. So, as I said, I'm an academic, and there was a study that I had read and had written into a paper by uh, Dr. Judy Swift and a Dr. Rebecca Poole and a few others from the University of Nottingham. I did go to the University of Nottingham. I did meet with her. I did interview her. I did go to Yale. I did interview Dr. Poole. They basically suggested that education by way of film helped to improve awareness in medical students and in nutrition counselors, and it goes on to say in the medical profession. So I thought to myself, what the heck? Why don't, why don't I just make a documentary? Which led to my going to Germany numerous times. Um, through all of my research and all of um, being in the UK numerous times, it became clear that the experts in what seemed to be the best solution, which was liposuction, were in Germany. So one thing led to another, and I ended up um, a wonderful woman from San Francisco contacted me, and she wanted to have surgery. We set the surgery up with Dr. Raprich in, um, in Germany, and he agreed to let me film it. So I showed up with my camera, I put on scrubs, and, um, and I um, started to videotape. I do have to tell you one little funny story, which is that as I was walking into the OR with my camera in my scrubs and just praying that I wouldn't throw up, he turned to me and he said, you have done this before, haven't you? And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, oh, I've been in an OR before. <laughs> I didn't tell him I was horizontal. But anyway, I videotaped it. It was fabulous. I was so incredibly um, interested. In fact, one of the doctors said I was more eager than a medical student. I think if I was 40 years younger, I'd go back to school and become a surgeon. But anyway, thank God I'm not that. So there were several trips to Germany. In November of 2013 was when I um, went and numerous other surgeons, including Dr. Stutz. And in March of 2014, rather than being behind the camera, I had a cameraman with me, and I was having surgery with Dr. Stutz. That's when I had my surgery. Additionally, Dr. Smith and Dr. Diane and Dr. Herbst and a number of other people came to Germany. We went to numerous surgeons and participated in a learning week, really. There was a gathering in Frankfurt. As I said, the story is long. Here are some of the pictures. I actually cut out a lot. I'm a storyteller. So this was um, a number of um, the surgeries. And um, you see on the left in the middle is Dr. Foldy. And there was something really moving for me that I could have found out about lipedema from reading her book and then end up in her clinic numerous times. So this is a group of us in March. Um, Dr. Smith and me, my cameraman, Dr. Diane, and the two women in front, uh, Sherry Fetzer, who runs Lipedema UK, she's going to be um, one of the hosts and contributors to the symposium we're going to talk about later. And Edley, who is a lymphatic therapist, she does um, lymphatic yoga therapy. And um, she is uh, trained at the Foley Clinic as well. Anyway, let me move on. <laughs> So just to step back, in April of 2013, I connected with Dr. Smith and Diane, and amazingly, they invited me into their OR, and I was able to begin to look at the lymphatic system and to be able to um, videotape the lymph node transfer. And um, there were new, numerous um, trips down to New York and videotaping in August of 2013. We had several women who came down, and they were had consults. We videotaped it all in March of 2014. Dr. Stutz, um, um, we were all at his clinic as well as a number of other clinics. In August of 2014, we were videotaping again. 
And in September, there were some surgeries at the Beth Israel, at uh, Mount Sinai Beth Israel with Dr. Smith in October. Uh, Dr. Smith was a uh, uh, presenter at the Lippy Ladies Conference via online. So we're doing a lot virtually these days. So, you know, when I first started this, I, I just kept saying to myself, nobody's going to care. Who cares about fat legs? Nobody's going to care. And then as I, as I started to do all these travels, it's like, why does it matter? It's because of all of us. We matter. We have something important. And um, that's the bottom line, is that it's an amazing community of women. And there's you there as well. It matters because you matter, because I matter, because we matter. So um, a little bit about the film. And OK, next is the preview. Now, this is going to take me a minute or two, because this has to be set up. And again, as I said, there's a good possibility I have to change presenters. My legs were so swollen, my, my knee was the same size as my ankle. I was sitting on the bed one day, I got out of the shower, and I was just in so much pain, like walking, it just felt like squish, 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 and just the throbbing pain of it. I was searching the internet one day, and I saw this picture, three pictures of legs, and the middle one looked like my legs. I'm like, oh my goodness, that looks like my legs. It just didn't make any sense to me that I had lost so much weight, and I was even eating better and exercising better than I had done when I lost the weight. And the doctor looked at me and he said, Amanda, I don't know much about this, but it looks as though you have something called lipedema. He looked at me and he said, oh, you have lipedema. People look at me and they're like, you know, just lose weight. And it's not that simple. And it's not my fault. When I found out I had lipedema, that didn't make me cry. <laughs> I was really happy. I was so happy. When I first was diagnosed, there wasn't much out there. What's out there now today is so much more than it was before. Hi, my name is Catherine Sayo, and I'm a professor at Cambridge College in Massachusetts and the founder of Lipedema Simplified. For years, I've suffered with weight issues. Perimenopause brought on an unexplainable weight gain, and after five very complicated surgeries that were based on a misdiagnosis. I found out that I have a fat disorder called lipedema. I was gaining weight and I was spending an absolute fortune treating what I thought was cellulite. And my doctor said I'd got gout. Sometimes I could barely get out of bed. My legs swelled up. But my ankles got bad when I got pregnant. Terrible bruising. My legs ached. You're growing fat, you eat too much. And I was always, always covered in bruises. I would go to the doctor and I was told I was too fat and to take diuretics. So it took me 30 years to work out what it was. So in stage one lipedema, over to the right here, you can see that there's an increase in fat on the leg all the way down to the ankle where there's a cuff and the skin is very smooth. There are almost no indentations. So if there are indentations, then we have stage two lipedema. You can see that in this case, most of the lipedema fat is concentrated on the abdomen and the upper thigh, um, but you can see indentations in the fat and you can also see pockets of fluid in the fat. In stage three lipedema, the only difference between two and three is, is that there begins to be a fold in the fat. So the fat has to fold over on itself, and it usually does that here on the medial knee, on the lateral thigh, um, lower and upper. Lipedema is a challenging diagnosis because it's purely clinical. In my idea, in my experience, it exists only in the extremities. We have no real idea 
how it is caused. We lack the diagnostic tools to say what is and is not lipedema. We make the diagnosis on clinical presentation grounds. Most significantly, they don't teach it in medical school. It has essentially little or no place in the medical school curriculum. It's, it's a newer condition, I think, as we, we all are, or, or, or new, more newly identified condition. In, in the U.S., you know, unfortunately, most doctors still don't know about it. And I've got to be honest, I really didn't even hear of that term lipedema until a few years ago. There is no way for people on the outside to know what causes that that disease. And when we have such widespread bias and discrimination towards people who appear to have obesity, those negative assumptions and bias are going to automatically be applied to individuals, even if they're suffering from an issue from which they have no personal control. All of a sudden, somebody said, you're so photogenic, like you should pursue modeling. And I was like, I'm too big. And I said, no, plus size modeling. I was like, what? It's wild because what actually made me be a plus size model is having lipedema. Because of lipedema, I have this insane figure and there's a 20 inch difference between my waist and my hips because of lipedema. The stats for a plus size model should be minimum 5'8". You need that height. You should be about a size 14. I am 5'7". I wear a 12 top and an 18 bottom. And I just kept getting those phone calls like, you be smaller, you need to be smaller, and over time I got into phone calls saying, you're huge, you're huge, and man, your, your self-confidence just drops. You can't be toned when you have lipedema. Maybe when, in the early stages, but I'm already stage two. My mother was overweight, especially heavy in her lower body, and everybody just accepted that this was the way she was and she felt bad about herself for not being able to lose the weight, particularly in her legs, but nobody thought to look up whether it had a name. No doctor ever said the word lipedema to her. Most of the time, if you hear hoofbeats and a neigh, you turn around and there's a horse. Occasionally, it's a zebra. Most of the time, when a fat woman walks into your consulting room, she has ordinary obesity, but sometimes it's lipedema. I would read the stories of people going to their doctor and just being looked at and told that they need to lose weight or that they need to have gastric bypass to lose weight. And I think more doctors need to be aware that the person sitting in front of you is telling you the truth. There's definitely a preference for most people towards a more thin physique. When students walk into medical school, they come in with, you know, holding those same opinions. If uh, a woman's presenting with a history of several decades of big legs disproportionate to their upper body and attempts to try to lose weight, really frustrated that they've dieted and they've exercised and they've been very rigorous trying weight management techniques and strategies and they've had no success, that there has to be an underlying reason. And then when you see that symmetric fullness of the hips and thighs and often the medial knee pads, fat lobules, it seems to then point more to the lipedema. So this last year I went to see an allergy specialist thinking, okay, I'll check for food allergies and see what's going on there. And I told him I have, di I have um, lipedema and he said never heard of it, so he popped it up on the internet, Wikipedia of all things, and he said, well, it's not a real disease, that's just um, something, a new trendy disease that fat women have made up so they have an excuse. That was what he told me. So again, not getting any support, no one to help you, no one to talk about any treatment or cure because they don't know and if they don't know then it doesn't exist. There is a bias that people have, that physicians have, no matter how much they say, I'm just going down a checklist of symptoms, it's not true. You have a bias and so they're going to look at you and they're going to say, Oh, you're just overweight. My biggest problem was that I listened to that advice and I stopped eating and I had so many issues with my metabolism and I was malnourished. I was a fat person that was malnourished, you know? And that's the lipidema conundrum because that's where patients themselves buy into the social value system that, you know, they must be eating too much and not exercising enough and yet 
they may be. It's just something that's beyond that. I think that that's where the, the risk for lipedema is, is that it's so often just assigned as general obesity and not thinking about could it be something else. We need people to stand up for themselves and recognize all of the influences and challenges. And until there's really a uniting voice saying, no, you know, this isn't acceptable to be treated this way, it's hard really to move the, <laughs> the needle uh, globally. And as a group, individuals with overweight, obesity, lipedema can really say, no, this is what we demand and we deserve to be treated this way. So I started my journey on The Biggest Loser from a casting call. To me, it felt like almost the magic pill. I just needed to get on The Biggest Loser and I was gonna do anything I could do. And I shared my story with America. I told them, you know, this is who I am. I was this young girl and I had always been told I had the pretty face, but never really felt like I had the body to, to feel as pretty as people would tell me I was. And I just had such insecurities and I wanted to be able to blossom. I wanted this chance to prove that I could be more than who I really thought I was. On the show, I lost 87 pounds. And then additionally, a little bit before and a little bit after, I'm down over 107 now. Back in the day, I used to blame it on my size and it was just uncomfortable to fly. But now it's uncomfortable for different reasons. My legs drive me absolutely nuts when I'm on the plane. I can feel them swelling and I can feel the tightness and I get restless leg syndrome. I feel bad for anybody that sits next to me because I'm constantly folding my legs in different ways and trying to put my legs up and they are so uncomfortable because of the way the swelling is and how tight it feels. The numbness, the pins and needles, it's just, it's not normal. I bruise super easily and if somebody just hits my leg the wrong way or just even touches my leg the wrong way, to me it feels as though I just had a hammer hit to it. Are these fat cells identical to, a, to the usual fat in the body? They seem to be resistant to certain processes. We mentioned diet and exercise don't affect them. Why? And if 350 million women in the world can't walk, can't go to work, can't be mothers, uh, can't function as they should be in their normal roles in society, then that's an enormous problem that we have to address. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the um, other computer now. And um, I just would just like to launch a little poll and give you a chance um, to give us a little feedback. So if you just take a moment and select all that apply. Um, again, the viewing was not as clear as it will be. And let me say that we were going to have that posted. Um, for everybody. We wanted to give the community an early preview, but that will be posted within the next week or two and you'll be able to see it without the jumpiness. But hopefully you got enough. So um, we just want to get a sense as to what you're thinking, what you're feeling. I'm just so grateful the audio worked well. You got a sense of the pictures. Oh, that's fabulous. We've got most, mostly everybody has voted. Take another, I'll give another 15 seconds or so, if you haven't had a chance to vote yet, give it another second or two. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and then let's take a look at the results. So, good, it looks like um, it looks like most of you have felt some kind of either validation or encouragement or empowerment. And for those of you who feel a little bit disappointed, let me just say that the purpose of this is also for you to give us some feedback. If you can see a way to make it better, just at the end of the webinar, there's going to be, um, there's going to be a, uh, a survey you can fill up. Okay, one more little poll, which is what do you want to see more of in the documentary? And take a mo we'll take one minute. So, you know, you, again, remembering you only saw a quick 10 minutes and it's 10 minutes from different parts of the movie, so it's almost like a long trailer. But what would be most helpful for you when you think about what else you would like to see? Fabulous. People are voting. Very, very, very interesting. 
Isn't this cool that we can be from all over the world and we can have a conversation like this? I'm so amazed and I'm so, I still feel so blessed. Even though I've had my moments in the past three days where I was ready to throw the computer out the window. <laughs> oh, there was a great YouTube where somebody pulled out a gun and shot the computer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take another few seconds and I'm going to close the poll. Okay, that's a minute, and so I'm going to go ahead and share the results, which is really interesting. So more information about treating and living with lipedema, and about the future of lipedema treatment and research, and more from doctors. And I can say with some certainty that you're, a lot of that will be in the rest of the documentary. Okay, so I'm going to take us back. I just want to say one thing more, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to Dr. Smith. But this is a group of lippy ladies that we um, that I put out a request if anybody would be willing to have their photos taken. So this was at a photo studio during a photo shoot, and I just want you to—I mean, we are amazing. I mean, women get together and we're able to support one another in just so many ways. And um, so I just again want to say thank you because none of this would be happening if it were not for the community that we've built. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Smith. And I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to turn my camera off and then give it to you, Dr. Smith. So you're all set. Thank you, Catherine. Well, uh, I'm really excited to get all that feedback, and I'm interested, especially in the 4%, because I think we, what we're really looking for here is to make sure that we're not missing something. Um, so I think you know, it's almost you need to know the things that we're not we're not getting right. And that's what that's what we need to, to figure out. So I look forward to hearing the comments. Um, in terms of my vision for lipidema, I, I think you know I, I come from this. I'm a surgeon. I, I operate on people. And you know, in a, in a week, I might be able to operate on several people, maybe half a dozen people, and affect their lives. But I think through um, the bigger lipidema project and increasing awareness and collaboration, that we have the potential, um, if we can get enough people involved, to really um, change the course of this for everyone who suffers from it. And that's really, I think, the goal of the project. It's it's something bigger. It's really about a movement. What we're trying to do is, is become a catalyst. And if I could go back uh, again to maybe my personal experience, when I came to um, into medicine, I, I actually started out wanting to become a plastic surgeon because of my interest in treating children. I wanted to be a craniofacial surgeon, basically focused on uh, pediatric birth defects. I happened to have undergone training as a microsurgeon who uh, did a cancer fellowship to learn how to use these techniques in pediatric patients. And I thought that there would be an ability to apply some of these techniques from other specialties to the pediatric population. Interestingly, my career uh, path has gone more along the lines of cancer, and, but I found that I've used my pediatric training, craniofacial surgery techniques in my cancer uh, surgeries and it's helped me innovate treatments that I might not, not otherwise have been uh, able to do. And what I see as a parallel in this is that we have the opportunity for this cross-pollination of ideas. We really need to bring people together who have different you know, expertise, areas of expertise. I am not a basic science researcher. I've done basic science research, but that is not my personal strength. And um, there are many clinicians who are experts in fat metabolism and endocrine uh, and um, genetics, uh, these people, if they could all come together in a room and start talking about what the opportunities were uh, to move ahead, I think we, we would accelerate this process. And I, I, to use another analogy, um, when you're trying to put together the pieces of a puzzle, if you just have a big pile of pieces, how do you know where to start? You have a lot of little tidbits of information that we're trying to put together to get an understanding of what you but what I usually do is I'll, I'll take those pieces, I'm sure most of you would too, you take the ones with the straight edge or a corner, 
and you start placing those because you know those pieces will start to fit together. And they'll give you a framework in which to put the other pieces together. What we need to do is organize and get the people together to create that framework, to kind of look at the big picture, uh, start putting, in the, put, putting those pieces together in an organized fashion so that we can start filling in the gaps. And I think that's really um, the vision for where we should be going in terms of research and treatments, trying to bring all these specialties together and starting to get a sense of the big picture of what's going on. Um, so, and what we're going to be doing, I think the, this documentary is going to be, has a specific role in terms of raising awareness. I think uh, the symposium has a role in terms of education. And I think uh, the think tank that we're planning on doing has a role in terms of this collaboration and breaking down the silos and allowing people to cross-pollinate between disciplines. So that's really my vision and my hope for the coming year in terms of what we can see happening and you know, to hopefully really accelerate. If, if we can be the catalyst that sort of lowers that threshold for this interaction so that the momentum can start to build, I think that will achieve that, that major first step. Um, so I think what we wanted to do is we received a lot of questions um, over the last few weeks. Um, Catherine went out and, and uh, put this out there that we were going to have this sort of end of year seminar and update. Um, we opened it up for questions. Uh, we would have liked to have done it live, except that there were so many people we felt that it, it just might not be practical. So people send in questions and we try to group them and, um, together under different headings. And I'll try to answer some of them. I, I will tell you right up front, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, trying to be objective about what we know and what we don't know and, and trying to facilitate this process. So, um, so to begin with, I think uh, there were a lot of questions that came in just about obesity versus lipedema. And um, what exactly are, is lipedema and what exactly is obesity and how, how are these two, how are these two related or different? And I think this is a big question. This is actually one of the things that I've been discussing with um, the basic scientists that I've spoken to. We've had a number of people from various uh, hospitals in New York and Boston that we're talking with. And, um, and hopefully we'll have collaborate, uh, international collaborators um, coming together to, to discuss this very question. But, and basically, right now, when we look at fat, we don't, you know, to the naked eye, it doesn't look any different than regular fat. Um, there are markers uh, that, are, that may identify differences in fat, in particular, level of inflammation. And I think inflammation is something that we know is related to fat. Um, the, our, our fatty tissue is really an organ in our body, and it, it can be affected. It, has, it produces hormones. It's, it's affected by hormones. It produces cytokines. Cytokines are um, basically, to put it simply, chemicals that affect other cells and um, can mediate different reactions. Uh, so it's a very active tissue. And I think we're just starting to get to notice um, how it relates to lipidemia is not clear. There are a lot of, sur uh, a lot of researchers who are looking at fat in terms of other disease processes, in particular diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But in terms of lipidema, I think that that hasn't really gained its, the attention that it deserves. And so what we're hoping to do is bring these experts who focus their efforts in um, fat and metabolism and looking at how these hormones interact and having them look at the subset of patients who have lipidema to see if there's something specific or different going on here. And then I think we can start saying, uh, lipidema fat is different from regular fat in that it has these markers. And hopefully we'll also be able to get to the core of you know, there's a, you know, what genes are involved, uh, how much of this is a genetic uh, condition, how much of it is just a metabolic phenomenon. So these are, these are all areas that we're looking at related to these questions about uh, obesity and lipidema. Um, somebody asked, uh, would, can we define lipidema, or should we define lipidema as a disease or a condition? Um, I think the semantics are interesting. I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, but I, I think lipidema is a, a disease uh, in the sense that it, it, there's a pathophysiology involved that leads to morbidity. And um, I think that we, we need to give it the gravitas of, of that title. Uh, 
we have to call it a disease so that people start to really look at it and treat it and give it the respect and, and attention it deserves, uh, just like many of the other diseases that um, affect far fewer people um, but get far more attention. So um, I think using diseases is, is, is appropriate for patients with lymphedema. Um, we had a lot of questions also related to vascular considerations in, in lipidema. And what we found is that lipidema isn't a solitary condition. There are a number of things that are affected by lipidema or affected in this condition or disease. Uh, the, the, the venous insufficiency that we see in, in patients with lipidema um, can occur in anyone. It, we know that um, uh, obesity can lead to venous insufficiency. But many people who are not obese also develop a venous insufficiency. But one of the things that venous insufficiency does, in particular in a patient with lipidema, it may can accelerate the issues of swelling. And um, if we step back and just look at the lymphatic system for a moment, the lymphatic system is basically um, a collection system for, for proteins, cellular debris, uh, and fluid that leaves the vascular the circulation gets into the tissues, it collects it, it filters it through the lymph nodes where it's analyzed before returning it back into the circulation. Now, it has a limited capacity. And once you overload that capacity, uh, you end up with swelling. And having increased volume of tissue, as occurs in lymphedema, taxes the lymphatic system. And at a certain point, as the lymphatic system gets overloaded, um, it can fail. If you think about the vascular system, when there's too much volume in the vascular system, the heart gets dilated, it, it, it doesn't pump effectively, and then it starts to back up. Um, the lymphatics have muscle. Once these lymphatics get dilated, those, that muscle becomes less effective in pumping, and if it dilates more, lymphatics back up. The valves that are in there, similar to veins, back up and become incompetent. They dilate, they become incompetent, and we get this lymphedema. Well, uh, in addition to the fatty tissue that we see in, in lipidema, um, if you have venous insufficiency, you have an increased production of fluid because the venous um, blood, the blood that's supposed to be leaving your legs and going back to your heart, instead of becoming a bunch of little columns of blood between these valves that don't have a lot of, the pressure is broken up. There's not a single column of pressure pushing back. As those valves become incompetent, you have one tall column of blood pushing backwards and down in your legs where the pressure is greatest, you're going to get more uh, fluid accumulation and more swelling. And this will further tax your lymphatic system and potentially accelerate the problem of uh, progression to lymphedema. So, yes, the venous system is very important, and it's also a consideration in surgery because these dilated veins. Uh, can be injured during surgery. Um, they can be disrupted and lead to um, significant bruising, uh, inflammation. Increased inflammation can uh, also lead to prolonged swelling and the progression of uh, lipolymphedema. So um, the venous insufficiency is an important consideration. Finally, I would say the deep venous system um, is uh, where dangerous blood clots can occur. And so after surgery, um, we always want these patients, uh, our patients, to be up and walking early because moving the blood through these deep veins is important. The calves pump the blood through the veins, and walking helps move the, the blood and prevents uh, stasis, which can lead to blood clots. The blood clots can be very dangerous and can damage uh, the veins and lead to prolonged swelling as well, as well as uh, blood clots breaking off and going up to the lungs, which can be fatal. So. Um, there's definitely an interplay between the venous system and uh, uh, lipidema and lower extremity swelling. And, um, so it's, it's not just one system we're dealing with. It's a multitude of lymphatics, the, the vascular system, as well as uh, inflammation and fat deposition. Uh, there was a question, should there be any tests performed prior to any surgery being done uh, to assess the venous um, the condition of the veins, and I would say yes, a duplex ultrasound is very effective, effective at diagnosing venous insufficiency, and um, depending on what the findings are, patients should either be treated beforehand uh, or counseled about the risks that might be associated 
Um, I think uh, there's also a question looking at uh, the lymphatic system. Should the lymphatic system be addressed or assessed uh, prior to any uh, lymphatic, uh, uh, lipidema liposuction? And I would say in patients who have anything but stage one um, or early stage two, uh, consideration should be given because there may be some clinical uh, compromise, especially if a patient gives a history of swelling and, and achiness at the end of the day. Um, there may be subclinical evidence of, um, of lymphedema um, or lymphatic compromise. And it's not that this should necessarily be the absolute contraindication. We need to, we don't, we don't know with, um, enough about uh, how the interplay between the stages of lipedema and what's going on in each stage in the lymphatic system to, to really make um, wide-ranging sort of dogmatic statements about what should and shouldn't be done. Uh, we're still trying to understand um, exactly what's happening. So I think it all has to be put into that context. Um, there are some studies that can be done in the office. Uh, we have uh, what's called a spy machine. It's a special um, uh, near-infrared fluorescent camera that can uh, fluoresce a, a dye that we inject in the feet, and we can see the lymphatics um, as, they, um, as the fluid moves up through, as the dye moves up through the lymphatics up the extremity. And we can see very early signs of, of lymphatic changes uh, using this uh, imaging technology. Let's see if there's other, quite a few questions about um, treatment for lipidema, and I'll, I'm just going to try and address some of these. Um, when asked, what are your top five recommendations for lipidema patients that they can do for themselves to stop the progression? Well, uh, this is a, a challenging question because I think that there's there are definitely things that can be done, um, whether it stops progression or whether it, it at least slows progression. Um, I think these are things that, again, we need to study more. I, we know that um, you know, taking care of yourself just in terms of diet and exercise, just being healthy is always going to be helpful. I mean, it may not cure it. It may not reverse it. Um, and in fact, you know, many patients, I think, complain or feel discouraged because when they lose weight, they lose weight not in the areas they want to lose it, but in the areas where... Um, where you know, it tends to go away early, it tends to exacerbate their disproportion. They use it in their trunk, um, but they don't use it in their legs. It actually tends to make them feel like the disproportion is, is, is exacerbated. Um, but it's still important to be healthy. And in terms of your lymphatics and preserving your lymphatic function, um, doing activity, uh, particular things such as swimming, uh, where um, you can. Uh, uh, move the muscles, you're, you can avoid bruising, you can, there's some compression from just the, the water itself um, that uh, helps with the lymphatic circulation and it helps um, move that fluid out of your extremities. Um, so I think uh, that certainly uh, exercise, eating healthily are, are always good recommendations. They may not cure, but they, they, they're not going to, if you eat poorly and you don't exercise, it's not going to help. Um, it can make things worse. I think in terms of um, compression and um, MMLD, I think that's a case-by-case -case basis because patients have different levels of uh, lymphatic swelling and um, edema. And I've seen patients who um, say it helps a lot. And I've seen patients who complain that it's uncomfortable. They, they don't do well with the massage or the compression because of discomfort. And I feel, and some that have had minimal effect and maybe they just don't have a lot of edema at this point. So I think there is a spectrum, and each patient has to kind of find that out for themselves. It's a bit of trial and error. Um, is it another question that came in, a couple questions uh, came in regarding uh, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or, or whether there were other ways to reverse the inflammation in the hormonal cascade that's affecting them and making the edema worse. I think this is the area that we need to look at uh, in terms of research and looking at um, addressing the pathophysiology. The um, inflammation is much more complicated than taking Motrin or an aspirin. Uh, there are many different inflammatory mediators, and a lot of the ones that we're looking at in fat have to do with things like interleukin-6 and 
telling process factor alpha and interleukinate and um, and some of the hormones are really lipid produced hormones, not just estrogens, but um, apomectin um, and some of the other uh, lipid produced hormones that can affect metabolism and how it, how fat is distributed within the body. So this is where our collaborations with basic scientists and explaining to them what we're seeing clinically and taking what they're understanding at, at a, a more fundamental um, understanding of lipid metabolism and integrating this and starting to look at things that may put the pieces, the framework that I mentioned earlier, that, that big outer square of them, so that we have a place to put these little pieces of information that we start uh, collecting through various um, experiments and studies. Uh, this is what we have to do. We need an agenda that really pulls everyone together so we can look at um, how is inflammation, uh, what, what's, is inflammation the cause of the fat? Is fat causing the inflammation? Is there some other trigger? Um, we can look at it from a genetic standpoint, endocrine standpoint, inflammatory standpoint, um, and, and hopefully then we'll have an idea of, um, of what sort of pharmaceutical uh, pharmacological manipulations are possible. Um, let's see. There's questions here um, about MLD compression and pumps from lipidema. Again, I think this goes back to what I said earlier. Um, there's a bit of trial and error here because not everybody has a significant amount of edema. Um, there is some edema, um, and not everyone will tolerate the, the interventions the same way. So I think um, it's important to at least give it uh, a try because you may benefit from it. Um, but I will say just from my what I've heard from patients who have undergone MLD, most feel some um, early benefit, and I think we can look at it as perhaps um, uh, hopefully preventing progression, but I don't think it reverses the underlying cause of lipidema. We're really looking at management. And if it helps the individual, I think that it's worthwhile. Um, but not everybody's able to tolerate it. Um, we have a, a number of questions regarding diet and lipidema. Um, you know, I will say that I'm not an expert on, on uh, lipidema uh, diets. Um, I've looked at a number of them, uh, you know, that are out there. I think. You know, there, there are things such as the anti-inflammatory diet that um, would seem to make sense. But again, without looking at what's really going on and understanding the real fundamental mechanism, I think it's somewhat simplistic to think that if we just globally reduce inflammation, that will we'll, we'll cure the lipidema. But um, I think that certainly um, most of these anti-inflammatory diets are fairly healthy diets. And... Um, and I think that some patients have experienced benefit. And so, again, I think some of this is trial and error because we don't have the basic science. But what we need is to do a, a, a study where we compare diets in patients with lipidema and then look at inflammatory mediators in patients with lipidema and see what that shows. And then we can make a recommendation. And then we can also study the mechanisms of what's happening. If there's a difference between, uh, let's say, see, you know, C-reactive protein in patients with um, lipidema or taking an anti-inflammatory diet, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a marker for whole body inflammation. And we know that obesity is associated with higher levels of C-reactive protein, to, um, whether lipidema is also associated with it. I, I'm, I'm not aware of data corroborating that, but um, it might, wouldn't be surprising. So. Uh, again, these are areas that are all part of the discussion that we're having right now with various researchers in terms of opportunities uh, to understand this condition better. Um, exercise for lipidema I mentioned earlier. I think exercise is helpful. Um, patients with lipidema do have a tendency to bruise her easily, so I think contact sports may be a little uncomfortable. And um, chronic bruising does cause inflammation. Uh, but I think uh, things such as walking and, and uh, swimming, especially, um, are very helpful. These are low, lower impact exercises that help pump fluid. They're good for the venous return in the legs. Um, they help um, 
decreasing venous stasis and the legs decreases fluid accumulation and that can that can definitely help with swelling. Okay, um, there are some questions here regarding lymphedema and lipedema. Um, the question says, if a lipid lady also has mild secondary lymphedema, does that preclude her from having wall surgery? Well, technically at that point, you'd be considered as having stage four. When we say lymphedema, we're talking about swelling that's due to, um, to damage from the, to the lymphatic system. And I think this is a subtle but important point to clarify. Many patients um, say, well, I have swelling, but um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's lymphedema. Um, what we typically talk about as being lymphedema is swelling that's related to a, a, a damage in the lymphatic system. So you can have venous swelling that causes edema, which is just tissue fluid, but your lymphatic system may be working over time and maybe transporting fluid twice as fast as normal. It just can't keep up. So that's not really lymphedema. That's a, um, that's a venous edema. And that can be edema from inflammation. Uh, and your lymphatic system can still be working totally normally, if not working at a higher level than normal. Um, when we get to, if you say that you actually have lymphedema where you have compromise of your lymphatic system, that's, that's a, a different situation. And when you, once you have um, compromised the lymphatic system, you are at higher risk for progression. And so uh, and you have to, I think, take that into consideration. Typically, uh, Hakan Gorsen, who is in uh, Sweden, has done a lot of liposuction in the past decade or more for patients with lymphedema. And he's been um, very adamant that patients have to maximize their um, conservative measures of MLD, um, compression, and wrapping to get the fluid out of their limb before you will consider doing any liposuction. This liposuction technique is very effective, um, but it does uh, require lifelong compression thereafter because the lymphedema is not corrected. So I think that um, for patients who actually have stage four um, lipolymphedema, we have to be, we just have to be very, um, clear in terms of what the objectives are in terms of, uh, regarding treatment. Uh, so a couple other questions. I, there were a number of questions to me personally about doing surgery. And, you know, as a surgeon, um, my, my main goal is not to do any harm. I, I want to help people as much as possible. And one of the reasons I got involved in lymphatic surgery is that I saw a lot of patients who basically um, had no other option other than conservative therapy and when that wasn't working they were becoming um, more and more disabled and I, I when we encountered the lipidema patients we found that that was also happening um, that um, you know, this this condition just basically progressed and it was even in some ways more recalcitrant to um, uh, conservative therapies because it wasn't necessarily the main issue it wasn't just the swelling, but the accumulation of this fat and the tenderness and so forth. So um, that's where I became interested in, went to Germany um, and visited a number of surgeons over there uh, to see what they were doing, Dr. Sattler, Rapridge, Dr. Stutz. And um, you know, I think they all had very good results with different techniques. And I can't say that I... I'm convinced that one technique is absolutely better than another. I think they may each have certain advantages. We've been working with the wall technique, and so um, I think um, you know it has some uh, appeal uh, because of the, the the way it disrupts fat and how it's extracted, and also the ability to limit the amount of fluid that's uh, in the, the extremity all at once. With the wall device, the fluid is injected and sucked out um, almost simultaneously. Uh, with the fatty tissue, so you can see the contour of the leg as you're working. Um, in terms of who we're seeing now, we were limiting our early uh, um, patient population to earlier stage um, lipidema, primarily because uh, they have the lowest risk of chronic swelling. I think as uh, you get into patients with stage three to stage four, um, there are more um, potential 
risk for chronic swelling, uh, for <clears throat> secondary um, comorbidities. And so I think just in terms of trying to be safe in our initial approach, that's why we started with the earlier stage patients. But I think every patient needs, needs treatment. And, um, and that's really why I think when we get to the big picture, surgery is not the ultimate treatment. Surgery is going to be a, um, a tool that we use to manage symptoms. And um, you know, if you look at what the, the buying the fat that's removed in liposuction relative to the buying the fat that is in a patient who has uh, stage three or four uh, epidema, it's relatively minimal. I mean, we may take out a, a few liters of fat, but that you know, relative to how many volumes, how many liters of uh, fat is in that extremity, and the volume is relatively small. But we know that it, it, it seems to improve, uh, decrease the sensitivity. Um, you know, patients feel that ambulation is easier. Uh, sometimes the gait is improved by removing some of these larger fat pads. And so there's definitely, I think, a role for it in managing, you know, but it's not really the cure. And so big picture-wise, we're really looking at trying to understand how we can reverse this condition and manage it, um, hopefully medically. Um, let me see what else we have here. Uh, yeah, there are questions about um, yeah, patients with lipolymphedema um, who are less mobile. You know, um, immobility just tends to make everything worse in terms of uh, lymphedema. Um, in lymphedema, we really count on uh, compression and muscle activity to move fluid because uh, the, the, the lymphatics aren't contracting normally. And, um, you know, stasis, lymph stasis is really um, the only way to get it to move is if, uh, is if you can contract the muscles against some sort of compression. It, it acts as sort of a pump that squeezes the fluid up out of the extremity, and hopefully any competent valves will help direct some of that fluid. Um, but uh, really, <laughs> if someone becomes immobile, that becomes a big um, stumbling block in terms of managing lymphedema. Yeah. One clarification requested. Sure. Um, so someone says, um, are you saying that if someone has lymphedema and lipedema, that it is considered stage four regardless of the presentation on the leg? For example, usually with stage three and four, you have overlapping um, back. Um, is that still considered like a lymphedema or a stage four? Say so that you have overlying. I mean, overlapping. You know, when the folds, the yes. folds of fat overlap. If you don't have that, but you have lymphedema, is it consi still considered stage four lipo lymphedema? Uh, I would say yes, because lymphedema is, if you have it, I mean, using the current definitions, and let's just be clear that uh, stages and these definitions are, are, these are created for convenience so that we can communicate amongst each other and have a reference. So there, for, for example, in, in lymphedema, there, there are probably a dozen staging systems that all look at different aspects of lymphedema and categorize it differently de depending on different measures. Um, we have a very simplistic uh, approach to, manage, uh, to staging lipedema because uh, it's been only a clinically, you know, about, you know, the, the diagnosis has been purely clinical up until now. There have been some studies looking at findings on um, MRI and looking at uh, uh, lymphatic vessels and different stages of, of lymphedema and, and what's going on, or pardon me, lipedema, but there, that hasn't really been integrated into um, the staging system. So what we're using is a clinical staging system where we say, okay, stage one, it's sort of you know, you have this increased um, accumulation of fat, but it's smooth, and in stage two, we have some nodularity, and stage three, we get these overlapping folds. But let's just say someone's heavier set and they're going to be more predisposed to having that overlapping fold than someone who's relatively thin but still has, has the condition. Um, certainly, as you progress, you're going to get, um, you're at higher risk for developing lymphedema. 
uh, because the more volume of fat that's there, the greater the fluid production, the greater the burden on the lymphatics, uh, the greater the risk of the venous insufficiency, and so forth, the, the less the mobility. So there are many things that can tend to cause it to steamroll as you get to um, the later stages of the theme. But if someone has an impaired lymphatic system, how do we, we don't all have the same lymphatic system. And so someone, you know, there are people who develop primary lymphedema. Their legs just swell. They're, you know, at a certain point in life, they, they, they're, something happens, they overwhelm their lymphatic capacity and they start swelling. Um, if you happen to be someone who uh, has the appearance of a stage two lipidema, um, and you start noticing that your your feet are swelling, and we do a lymphocentigraphy, and we see that the lymphatics are refluxing and they're not working well, you have lipidema and you have lymphedema, and that technically would, from the clinical staging, make you stage four. Um, even though the appearance might not be there. But physiologically, you're in this situation where you're going to have fluid accumulation and there's impairment of your lymphatic system. But again, I think this is somewhat of a limited perspective and we get caught up in the stages and we, really we have to look at this as a bigger picture, you know, sort of a, what's going on in this patient physiologically. Um, there, there are multiple systems involved here, the lymphatic, the vascular, um, the subcutaneous fat, there's hormones and inflammation, cytokines. Any of those things can be thrown off in different levels that could cause different elements of this to be worse or better in one patient versus another. Potential. This is the thing. These are the things that we have to look at. And maybe we'll be staging people differently. We'll be looking at their, you know, C-reactive protein level, and we'll be looking at their. Uh, we'll be doing a biopsy and, and saying, no, you know, we'll check for these markers and you don't, you don't show the, this inflammatory mediator so you're less likely to progress. So, you know, and we'll treat you differently. We may have a whole different staging system. So um, I think this is an evolving, uh, an evolving area. And so hopefully we'll, we'll, that'll be clarified as we learn more. But technically, I would say if you have lymphedema and lipidema, we, we typically say that that's stage four. Um, so moving on, um, I think because I, I don't want to, we're kind of getting towards the end of our time here, and um, there were a few other questions. Let me just take a look through here. Okay, so basically um, insurance questions, I think, you know, to be succinct, and I think Catherine is going to have a, a, another webinar with um, some patients who have been successful in getting coverage for their uh, lipidema surgery, and maybe we can talk more. Well, you'll have the opportunity to ask them questions directly about how they were able to do it. But um, uh, the question was, should it be covered by insurance? And I think if there's enough morbidity uh, that it justifies it, that's a societal choice. Um, obviously, someone has to pay for it. We all end up paying for, for insurance that covers any medical condition. But if there's morbidity, um, which for many patients there is, I think it should be covered. And we, we try to advocate on behalf of patients, but obviously the patient has to be an active participant in this because right now one of the big hurdles is that we don't have a diagnosis code even for lipidemia. And that creates a big barrier to treatment. So one of the things that you know, we need to do and is to try and get the insurance community to acknowledge that it's a real condition. Again, this comes from awareness, this comes from um, patients advocating on their own behalf as well as physicians. So uh, I think we still have a lot of work to do on that front. Um, so the last few questions here, I guess, asking about research. We talked a lot about what we're looking at in terms of research support for our efforts. I think it's going to be very important for us to um, be able to, to help fund um, research. There's very little funding. Um, for lipidema research. Um, the Friedman Center has already invested uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into trying to get this public awareness campaign going to try and jumpstart things. We're really, but, you know, the, the effort is being put forth to really on a bigger scale um, to try and get people together so that we can really service, hopefully this, all these things that we're doing now, the, 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 the movie, the documentary, uh, the symposium, the think tank, these are all in an effort 
to catalyze the, the reaction that needs to take place. We, we really need to make get the process going, and then I think it will build up steam. I think once the critical mass is obtained, um, we're going to see it blossom. But it needs to be fueled, and the, the, the fueling is going to come through fundraising. We have to raise funds um, to finance this, and, and we're putting in a significant uh, amount of resources to get it started. But I think the community and, and reaching out to people you know and anyone else that can help is going to be critical. And I think also advocating, getting your physicians to advocate, uh, educating your physicians, reaching out to them is going to be very, very important in this effort. Getting them to go to a symposium uh, to learn about it or to become uh, an educator within their own medical group and say, listen, you know, I got this, you know, this information packet. I'd like you to take a look at it and maybe share it with your, your, your physician uh, colleagues so that they're aware. I think that'll be very powerful. Because at, at some point, you just need enough people to know about it, and then it, it, it'll start expanding. Um, so, Catherine, maybe I'll, I, I'll turn it back to you at this point. I think we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here, so I want to make sure that you're able to get everything in about what else is going on. Sure. Um, I wanted to briefly mention a couple of things. Really, when we looked at the distinction around cure and awareness, um, as Dr. Smith talked about, the whole idea of bringing together a lot of healthcare providers, um, clinicians, uh, researchers, scientists, and also those of us who have lipedema. So with that end in mind, um, the sort of first international symposium on lipedema is scheduled for Friday, April 17th and Saturday, April 18th in New York City. Um, Dr. Foldy is coming over to be the keynote speaker. Additionally, we have confirmations from several of the uh, doctors from Germany and Sweden and Dr. Waxen from here, who's the expertise in lymphedema and lipedema. So we have um, uh, the two days. One day, the Friday, will actually be uh, sponsored CMEs, or credits provided by Mount Sinai Beth Israel continuing medical education credits. So um, it's a good thing to just get the word out to healthcare providers and clinicians and that kind of thing. On Saturday, there'll be a double track. Um, one track will be a think tank, and the think tank will consist of the, um, this cross-section of thought leaders in each of the domains around healthcare and or research including a geneticist, et cetera, so that what there can be is a real brainstorming think tank about how to move forward with the research agenda to look at the etiology, the cause, and the cure for lipedema. While that's going on, there'll be another track for us lippy ladies. And um, Sherry Fetzer from the UK has uh, graciously agreed to co-direct it and um, another woman here in the U.S., Kimberly Montgomery, has also offered to step forward. So uh, several of us are putting together a day of what are the day-to-day -day things that we need to know about. So there will be people presenting on diet and exercise and um, MLD and compression and all of the things that we all learned um, day by day, and hopefully we can have that sort of focused in a day-long gathering. And then on Saturday night, there will be the, um, the premiere of the um, documentary. And right now, we're in the midst of going through the venue choices, but we're talking to the Lincoln Center, which is amazing. I uh, sort of felt like it was like a little fairy tale come true. It's the most amazing place. And there's us, the lippy ladies at the Lincoln Center. So um, because we have such a broad community, one of the things we're looking at is either setting up real-time viewing so that, if possible, we're going to see if we can get live streaming. So as it's going on, you can sit at your computer and be there for parts of it. It wouldn't be for all of it, but it would be for parts of it. And um, we're also looking at recording the sessions so you can also watch, from late, uh, watch later on. And I'm going to just launch a very quick poll that asks, 
Um, just so we can get an idea as to who's thinking they'd like to come to New York, who'd like to watch online in real time, who'd like to watch later in a recording. If we get some sense of it, it will help us in planning the best way to move forward. Because um, streaming online is a really big deal. And if it's a smaller percentage, then it may be best to do it in another way, which it looks like it might be because it looks like most people would like to have a recording afterwards. Well, let's give another few seconds. If you haven't had a chance to vote, go ahead and vote. So your vote counts and your voice counts. And we want to set this up so that, again, <laughs> you really want to, this is for you. Another five seconds. OK, I think that's pretty much everybody who's going to vote. So. Okay. Okay, so 25% plan to register and come to New York, and it looks like the majority of you would want to watch a recording after the event rather than in real time. So I think that helps to clarify that, um, which is good. Okay, now I want to talk about the awareness campaign. So um, there are three aspects that we're looking at right now in the social media domain in order to raise awareness. And most of it right now is for raising awareness with other women, for other women who think they might have it. And so I'm going to um, introduce you to Noah. Noah is our social media genius. He's been absolutely instrumental in moving things forward. So we've been working with him now for a number of months, and he's just helped in so many ways. So, so far, we've been doing several tests. And I think it's important just to note that um, over the past two months, we've gotten close to three quarters of a million impressions, which means that our ads, and all of the ads have the little lippy lady on it. So this one is the largest producing ad that we did was this quote from Beyonce. Basically, there were 266,000 impressions, but out of that, 106,000 were shared. So essentially what it's indicating is the potentiality for this to go viral, which is what our goal is, is that people start sharing it. The more people can start sharing it, the more we can move on. Okay, here are some of the other posts that we tried to more or less success. Thunder Thighs was a good producer, as was Beyonce, quote. Um, and we'd like to extend an invitation for you to participate. So um, we're in the midst of putting together a um, manifesto. Stand up to Lipedema Manifesto. And I'll be posting this. Um, we'll be having this on lipedemaproject.org. But essentially, it's a way to stand up and say, hey, wait a second. I am so much more than this disease that's gotten little attention. And so what we're going to encourage people to do is um, we'll have a template, make a sign that just has the hashtag so much more, and then you fill in the blank. Here's some that I did with another lippy lady that's working with me. And um, we just put up, she um, did one and her son crossed it out and went from I'm a great mom to I'm an, she's an amazing mom. And for me, I wrote one about loving my students. And Meg sent a couple in. Isn't she is beautiful. <laughs> and she's loved by family and friends. Those are her kids, aren't they adorable? And um, Kimberly and her daughter, so she's the number one dance mom. So you get the idea. The idea is for you to be creative and to own and claim that we're so much more than having lipedema. Um, another campaign that we're starting is pinnables, shareables, and treatables. So they're little snippets to raise awareness. Um, though we have examples, I'll show you a few, and we're going to ask you to write your own. You can take a photo with it written and post it to Facebook, pin it on Pinterest, tweet it, share with others, and just use the hashtag so much more. <coughs> no one owns a hashtag, 
But the more it gets used, the more it starts to spread. And here are some of the snippets. Um, we're so much more than a misdiagnosis. We're so much more than fact. It's not just what you see. Lipedema is so much more. It's not lifestyle choices. Lipedema is so much more. So you get the idea that it puts you and the disease and that there's so much more going on here. So um, additional tools that are going to be available, and this is for the community, and it's also for everyone. The whole idea is to reach, you know, right now there's a few thousand of us. Um, and, you know, it's to reach the 16.999% of women that don't yet know, and, that, and that's in the U.S., if you look at the UK and all the rest of Germany and everywhere else, we're talking a lot more. But all of the above, plus e-learning courses, the vignettes, there'll be um, videos, short videos, 15 to 20 minute videos of all the different interviews of the women and of the experts so that you can get more in depth. The uh, documentary, documentary by its very nature is 50, 55 minutes. And I have an obscene amount of film, so we want to make it available to everyone. There's going to be a toolkit, um, like an advocacy kit, talking to your healthcare professional. How do you educate your healthcare professional about lipedema? And an iBook that we're working on, almost like a lipedema manual, and all of that will be available on lipedemaproject.org. Okay, now to talk a little bit about the research and sort of. What sort of happened through all of this is, um, so just to let folks know that the Friedman Center has committed funding for the Lipedema Project, excuse me if I'm stuttering, for half a million dollars. And that money is going to the completion of the documentary, to the building of all these tools, to the social media campaigns, symposium. So it's mostly focused on awareness raising. Um, so what we've been able to do is the documentary and all of the pieces above will be available at cost. And there'll be an opportunity for anybody to make a donation directly to the Friedman Center to go for research. It's a nonprofit. It's a 501c3, so donations are tax deductible. So what you'd actually be paying for is whatever it costs. So the DVD, whatever it costs to have it printed, plus the shipping and handling and its fulfillment to have it shipped to you, that's what you pay. And then the donation button is for you. If you're financially challenged, take what you need, just at cost. If you have more and you can share it, if you know any ways to help us get funding, the kind of research we're talking of doing is in the many, many, many millions of dollars to get as quickly as we need. And I'm determined. I'm sure we can do it. Um, the, um, when we looked at how to do the first opening for fundraising, the documentary premiere at the Lincoln Center, the reason why you might ask is that we're going to be at the Lincoln Center is it will be a fundraising event. And the fundraising event will be to raise funds for lipedema research. Um, so we're just in time. <laughs> we're just finishing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you uh, in every language and from all over the world. And I want a special shout out and a special thank you to Dr. Smith. <laughs> um, you really are making a difference in the lives of millions of women. I remember I kept saying to you, why are you doing this? You don't have fat legs, so why are you doing this? <laughs> I don't know people with fat legs. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity, your curiosity, your hanging in there and asking such good questions and really being willing to look for something and to bring together some of the top people in the world in order to solve this problem. It takes a level of commitment and caring that is astounding. So it's just amazing to be able to work with you. So. Alone, we can Catherine, do. Catherine, I, I have to I have to say one thing to that, um, and I'm sure many of you who know Catherine know that she's been tireless in this. It's been a, a very long, long project. She's been doing this for almost three years, uh, so I have to say I'm just 
facilitator. <laughs> yeah, you're doing all the all the heavy lifting, and I and I I think I appreciate it. And I'm sure all the people that are are for viewing appreciate how much you've done. So uh, I just want to mention that. Thanks. Well, so according to ha Helen Keller, alone we can do so little. Together we can do so much, and it's true. It's absolutely true. It's amazing. So. Um, Dr. Smith mentioned we're going to, we have another webinar schedule. It's going to be a panel of women who've been able to successfully get insurance coverage, coverage for lipedema. It is free, courtesy of the Lipedema Project. Donations are gratefully accepted. There'll be a way to make a donation if you so choose, and it would be most welcome. But, you know, if you know your financial situation. We want to make it available to everyone. It's January 25th at 2 o'clock. Um, 2 to 3.30, and our panel is Rhonda Dabney, who she had surgery in L.A. with Dr. Graz now and was covered by insurance. Tina just had surgery in, I think it was St. Louis area, and it was recent. It was just the past couple weeks. Jennifer, and um, I'm not sure who Jennifer had surgery with, but she's also been covered by insurance, and Lee had one or two procedures and she had several to go and they're all covered by insurance. So these women agreed to share what they did and to support everybody and um, that would be great. And I wonder, I can't remember if I have a poll. You know what, let me know if you're interested. I'll post something on um, uh, Lipedema Project where you registered for this and I'll get pre-registrations for the insurance seminar so I'll know how many seats we need for the um, webinar. Our contact information is it's from the Friedman Center in, um, at um, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. You can get more information about the symposium at symposium2015 at lipedemaproject.org, webinar at lipedemaproject.org, but any follow-up. As soon as I close out, um, as soon as I close out, you're going to be uh, given a little survey. And if you could take the time for anything in the survey that you want us to know, what can be better? Um, what's missing? What's, what are, in what way are we not quite hitting the target? It's also okay to say what worked for you. You know, what did you like? What didn't you like? What could be better? We want to make it as, as, right, and as right on target as possible. And I think that brings us to a close. Now, Catherine, I'd like to add one, one thing. I, I think you know, this is really, um, this whole effort is really about you who are out there attending this, seminar, uh, this webinar. So your feedback is really the, the most important thing um, that we can get from this in, the, in this first step going forward because we're, we're, there's so many things that we're trying to accomplish. Um, but it really, we need this to be an interactive um, exchange. And Catherine and I and many of the other people that have been working on this have been interacting a lot. And hopefully it's evolved to a certain point. But, you know, there, there are a lot of perspectives on this uh, that need to be heard. And we really sincerely want to hear your, your um, critiques, uh, both uh, positive and negative. So um, thank you. Uh, again, for, for attending and, and spending this uh, uh, afternoon with us. Um, great. Um, okay, Dr. Smith, I just launched another quick poll so that to get some instant feedback. So take a few minutes, and let's see what other people are saying. And we'll just leave this open for another few seconds, because mostly everybody has voted. So one of the things that I see is um, we're at 76% say you want another webinar soon. In the survey that comes up once the webinar is closed out, be sure to put in the comments section what you would most like to have us do another webinar on and who you would like to be part of that webinar. We want, as, as Dr. Smith said, I'm going to share the results with you now. Um, the majority of everyone wants another one. Well, that's interesting. I, I'm the one who thought that people would want it to be a little more interactive. But um, let's play with it and see what we can do. We'll try it out on the insurance seminar.
Great. This is great. Thank you so much for everything. That's it. It's Thank a wrap. You, <laughs> it's a wrap. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> bye bye.